This morning, as we continue our study on parables, our scripture comes from the um, book of Luke, sixth chapter. And you can follow along on the screen, or it will be located in your pew Bibles. It's verses 46 through 49. Um, so you can also just listen. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I'll show what it's like when someone comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging deep and laying the foundation on bedrock. When the flood came, the rising water washed against that house, but the water couldn't shake the house because it was well built. Those who don't put into practice what they hear are like a person who built a house without a foundation. The flood water smashed against it and it collapsed instantly. It was completely destroyed. This is another one of the many parables of Jesus Christ. I wanted to, at the very beginning, make sure we all remembered what a parable was. That's what I'll ask you. The definition that I shared that I thought was so lovely was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, so even simpler put, it's a, it's a not true story, not a factual historic story. Um, this didn't necessarily happen. Jesus didn't know of two people who endured a flood. But it's an example to prove a point of something that Jesus was teaching. So today's story is a, a remarkably simple one. And this is why Jesus did this, because we can envision these things. Especially after this summer, we all have images of floods in our brains. Uh, we, we can imagine houses, we can imagine floods. Uh, but it's, it's a practical way of understanding what it means, uh, what the consequences are of, of following or not following the teachings of Jesus. So Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, Why do you call me Lord? Why do you give me that title? If you're not going to listen to what I'm telling you. He says, When someone hears my words, it's like a builder who has dug down deep and found bedrock and built their house upon this as their foundation. He said, when you don't listen, it's like just building your house right upon the sea. And the waters will come, and one house will stand firm. And the other one, to, to quote verbatim here, collapses instantly. It is completely destroyed. The sand is not a good foundation for your house. That's the first thing probably you should pay for this. I looked up uh, for more uh, a more clinical definition of the word foundation, since it's something that this revolves around and we'll be using a lot today. Um, the one that I found that I thought was uh, probably the best was the lowest load-bearing part of a structure. Load-bearing. The thing the thing that is carrying all of the weight for the structure. So, to build a house without means that the house has to bear all of the weight. So, when we, when we talk about this, um, this example when Jesus talks about this, he's got uh, somebody who, who has the foresight to dig down, to build a foundation directly on the bedrock. Uh, and I don't know if that's a, a thing here when... Uh, I was growing up, our hometown had four feet of topsoil and solid bedrock. So if people had had a pool, it was only four feet deep because it was bedrock. So um, that's what I think of when this. You dig down and they, they lay the foundation directly on the rock versus sand that uh, we all know we've all been on the beach. Maybe you know, I'm assuming here. You built the castle and that wave comes in and and has different thoughts on how that castle, castle should look. You had a very distinct plan, and then now it's a lot smaller. Um, that water washing away the sea. So when we think of foundations of faith, Jesus is challenging us to, to look at two questions. Where do we find our load-bearing support for our faith? And what do we rely on to uphold us? When I was about 13 years old, my dad got on this kick. Uh, he, he wanted to, to have us start rock climbing. Has anyone been rock climbing before? 
our um, our health class or something had a had a rock climbing wall in there. So we took the classes and we learned how to tie knots and, and to say funny words like belay. And uh, we climbed, me, my sister, and my dad. And um, my sister is three years younger than me and uh, was, was much smaller than me uh, and less strong than me. But she was a much better rock climber than I was. Um, and I didn't understand why for the longest time. I would get up about three quarters of the way and I would be holding on just as tight as I could until my forearms would just start on fire. Um, not literally. But, uh, and then my hands would seize up and then I would have to you know, let go of the wall and ease my way down. And it was just, my sister would like, <whistles> ring the bell right up at the top. I never understood. It was a, it was a darn good thing. Um, it wasn't until years later, my sister still enjoyed rock climbing for much longer than I did. Um, and then when I got to be much, uh, much older, um, I could no longer, she could no longer belay for me, which is the person at the bottom because I weighed too much. If I fell, it would pull her up off the ground. So I'd actually have to hitch the back of her harness to the ground. So when she'd lower me down, her feet would just be dangling. And it didn't, it didn't instill trust in me. So, I would just watch her climb, and I watched, and sometimes she would get to a spot where I could see her hands would start shaking, and she would just kind of ease sit back down in, into her harness. And I thought, I never do that. I never once took a break. I would get high enough that I would, I would get scared of falling, and I would hold all of that in my hands and my arms. My arms are not strong enough to hold my body in that way. I was relying too much on my own physical strength. Which, no matter how strong you are, there's a breaking point. So when I look at what it means to, to have support, I think of that. What was I relying on? Where did I find uh, what was upholding me? Myself. It didn't, it didn't work well. Definitely didn't work as well as, as trusting the freedom and trusting the system and being able to relax. Ultimately, I got in my own way. Faithful living is rep relying upon God. Faith is action, but action has to leave room to trust in God. There are plenty of people who Decide they know what God has in store for them, and they want to go and do that. Just like the disciples. Disciples had wild ideas. It's about this time in, in the book of Luke. It's actually shortly after this. But two of the disciples come and say, Lord, when we get to heaven, my brother and I, we're going to sit on your right hand and your left hand. Is that cool? And Jesus is like, what are you guys talking about? Like, what? How did this come about? And, and so they just snowballed together. They, just, they, got, they got to a point where they were not listening to what Jesus had in store for them. And that's what all the confusion of, of uh, Palm Sunday, when we get there, we'll talk more about it. That's where all this confusion comes in, because people weren't listening to what Jesus was saying. They were excited about Jesus, and then they got excited about themselves, and they followed what they thought was best. So faith is action. But that action has to leave room for God to drive the boat. This might mean following your call into ministry, even when it feels like you're ill-prepared. Or being willing to volunteer, even though you don't feel skilled. Talking to someone about God before you know all the answers. We rely too fully on our own strength, our own knowledge, our own talents, our own leadership, and we aren't preparing for the times that we will just not be enough. It seems really pessimistic to say something like that, but there will be a time that we are just not enough. A situation will arise that we just can't heal on our own. Jesus said it. The flood, he said when the flood came, not if, When these things happen, we just can't do it on our own. The good news is Jesus doesn't expect us to do it, do this on our own. 
This is the whole story. The people who tried to do it on their own built on sin. They said, my house is strong. I don't need to work. We are called to build our faith in action. We are called to live the commandments of Jesus. And by ordering our lives, we are actually putting our faith in God and trusting Him. What this means is building a foundation on the rock of Jesus' teachings and the rock of the Holy Spirit in us. We have to be willing to follow. If not, we can't, Jesus says, you can't call me Lord, Lord, and not follow and send me. Maybe it's where I'm leading you. Putting our faith in God means that we trust that his commandments are helpful guides. His word is truth. His call is wise, and his spirit is power. We use these things to relinquish just a little bit of control. Now I'm looking out there, and I'm seeing some people that might be a little bit like me. You think, I have to do it, or it won't be done right. I need to be the one. And Jesus said, I got this. We need to be willing to let go a little bit. It's not by our own strength and ability that we will endure, but by our faith and certainty and the fact that God's the only one strong enough to see us through. The story of rocky and sandy houses is ultimately a call to live your life trusting God. Wherever that leads. Sometimes it's to engage in an uncomfortable conversation. Sometimes it's stepping out of your skill set to help someone. Sometimes it's letting God steer everyone to learn. But all the time, being really to, willing to live into the path God is traveling ahead of you, waiting for you to catch up. Let us remember this story and not wait until the waters begin to rise to be trust in God. Let us prepare today. Let us pray.